Uh, hi, my name's Colin Rowe and uh, I'm part of the team that designed the Top, Club, uh, Top Gear Space Shuttle, Midi Down the Ski Jump and the Blue Peter Rockets. Uh, I'm George Abbey, I, uh, I'm with Rice University in Houston, Texas and before that uh, I was with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration for a number of years and involved in all the manned spaceflight programs from uh, Mercury on through to the Space Shuttle and the Space Station. I'm Reg Turnhill. I'm the oldest working space correspondent, well into my 90s, I'm afraid. But as the BBC aerospace correspondent, I covered all the manned space flights throughout the early years, and especially Apollo, of course. Hi, I've already spoken to all of you, I believe, before, but I'm Richard Garriott. I'm the second generation astronaut. My father, Owen Garriott, went up on Skylab, which Rich covered, as well as the STS-9, which you probably also covered. And uh, I just returned from space uh, this last October. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm Chris Riley. I'm a former planetary scientist, worked on some of the very early uh, space shuttle missions, in fact. And um, more recently, I'm a journalist and filmmaker I was one of the producers of uh, Ron Howard's recent seven feature documentary, In the Shadow of the Moon. Hello, and I'm Chris Oliver, and I had the enormous luck to be allowed to pilot Concorde for 10 years, from 1976 to 1986. So enthusiastic was I that I went to the BBC and said, it's time you made a complimentary film about Concorde, which we did, a half hour program documentary which was criticised for being too uncritical about Concord. Um, this is a question for Red, Red Turnhill. Why are you able to maintain a neutral objective mind when you interviewed Werner van Braun, even though he was a Nazi? <laughs> Were you able to keep an a, uh, open mind? Uh, <laughs> Well, it was a very difficult relationship at first because um, our first son was born during the Blitz in 1940. Our second son, who is sitting there, uh, was born uh, in 1944 in a hail of V1 and V2 bombs, uh, which uh, was a great burden for my wife Margaret, who's sitting there. The result was that when I began to be on ground, it was a long time, it was two years before I could persuade myself to shake hands with him. But then in later years during Apollo, we were meeting almost every day. He was the perfect interviewee and we gradually grew to be friends. And so I suppose that was the way of things. But he, he was a brilliant man, of course. He was the perfect propagandist. He always knew what to say at the right time when NASA was running a bit, of short, a bit short of money uh, to frighten Congress into giving NASA a few more million dollars uh, for the next flight, for the next space mission. And next, a question for Richard Garriott. Describe how you felt when you saw Earth from space. Well, my impressions of the Earth uh, actually changed over the days and weeks that I stayed in space. Even the first view was actually uh, you know, profoundly beautiful, um, but I wouldn't have described it necessarily as life-changing. But what happened after seeing the Earth day after day and seeing more of the Earth and more of the systems of the Earth and more of the parts of the Earth, uh, it really built into an impression that really is uh, life-changing. And, and even after I've thought about it over time, has continued to kind of deepen my uh, impressions of space and the importance of, of acting upon some of those impressions. What was it like to work with the Top Gear guys? Um, it was fun, but it's hard work because um, when we're building it, then just like in the real world, we've got schedules to meet and things have got to work on the TV. Um, it is good fun to work with them. They all, they're all virtually the same as you, you think they are on TV. They're like that in real life. Um, 
like having laughs and jokes <coughs> and uh, the, the flight and the ointment basically working with them all is stick because he just stands around and doesn't say anything all day. How powerful did you feel when flying the Concorde? I didn't feel particularly powerful, but I knew I was flying an aeroplane which was immensely powerful. The uh, surge on takeoff was astonishing. At that stage, we had 95 tons of fuel on board, and during the takeoff run, we'd be burning that at a rate of 80 tons per hour to give 40,000 pounds of thrust per engine. So, a lot of thrust. And immediately after takeoff, I remember thinking, this is something quite different. We are, Concorde is about speed, and I've never been this fast, so close to the ground. Even though we were well below half the speed of sound at that stage. And of course, at 29,000 feet, on goes the thrust, the reheat comes on again, and you start to climb and accelerate at the same time. And then the magic of Concorde, you could turn off this boost and this reheat at 1.7 times the speed of the sound and still continue to accelerate. So I felt I was flying a very powerful machine. Fantastic. And a question for Chris Riley. How did you become interested in space and astronomy? Thank you. Well, the short answer is that I, I'm, I've always been more interested in planets than, than stars. I mean, I live on a planet, so I can kind of come to terms with this a bit more than I can a star. Um, and I was born at a time when um, we were first landing on, on other planets. Uh, I, was, uh, I was about eight or nine, I think, when Viking, Viking uh, robots landed on Mars, and we, for the first time, uh, got images of, an, of, of the landscape of another world, another planet. And shortly before that, um, the Russians had managed to take uh, images of the surface of Venus, even harder job. A year after all of that, Star Wars came out. <laughs> and I went to see that film about ten times. And for me, it was just the images that George Lucas had made of other planets, of other worlds, that were, were, were real as far as I can send out there. I mean, who knows? What planets there are, obviously binary star systems uh, beyond um, our own solar system. Maybe there are some. And so the combination of all of that was a really heady time for me just growing up when I was about your age. And it's always stayed with me and shaped the rest of my career, I suppose. And finally, question for George Abbey. What is your opinion on those who believe that the moon landing, landings were a hoax? Sorry about the question. Well, I don't believe it's a hoax because I was involved in it, so uh, I don't really think it, uh, you can make a case for it being a hoax because there's, you look at the, the mission and you look at the pictures and you look at the, all that was done in preparation and the execution of the mission, and there's no way you can conclude that uh, it was a hoax. You look at the pictures on the moon, and, uh, and it, it certainly at that point in time we had a space race going on, and the Russians and the United States were very competitive, and I think uh, if it had been a hoax, I think you would have heard about it uh, quite quite loudly from the Russians. And uh, if I could add to that, I can assure you, if it had been a hoax, I'd have had to be part of it uh, because I was there. I knew all the ast early astronauts. I knew all the Apollo people. I worked with all the engineers and technicians. It's unbelievable uh, that. Not one of them would have been a, would have nudged me afterwards and said, Reg, you know, we 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 faked it all on a on a salt lake uh, somewhere in Australia or something. <coughs> I can assure you, I was there and it was not faked. Did you think it was crap? 